Get cozy, comfort lovers. In today's episode, we sit down with Jamie Harris, the founder of This Is Jay, a pajama and loungewear brand proudly recognized as one of Canada's fastest growing in 2022. At 9 a.m., we launched and we sold out in 45 minutes. And it was this moment where I said, everyone is at home, everyone is feeling insecure and uncomfortable, and we can provide that comfort. And I said, I'm making a decision. We're pulling all of our deposits and we're putting it all into e-commerce. In this episode, we explore the lessons from Jamie's 21-year business journey. Witnessing her leadership evolution, navigating turbulence, and relying on creativity and perseverance for success. Let's dive in. Jamie, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm very excited to talk with you. You are the founder and CEO of This Is Jay. You've been in business for 20 years and your brand has stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the beginning and talk about your founder's story. I was a student at Dalhousie University. While I was getting my BA, I was also doing some courses at the art college there. Yeah. And I was trying a bunch of different things and my roommate had a sewing machine. And so I sewed a headband to keep my hair out of my face during exams. Then I was shopping, wearing that headband one day and the store owner asked me where I got it. I said, I made it. She's like, can I buy them? Do you sell them? I'm like, sure. Yes, of course. And that's sort of what launched it. And so when I graduated from university and moved back to Toronto, I wanted to expand it and see what I could do with it. Yeah, I love that story. Uh, when I saw the headband, I said, yeah, I remember that moment in time mm -hmm. when those kind of broke on the scene. So congratulations for having that insight. When you look back at who you were mm -hmm. in the beginning, were there obvious qualities that you had back then that would become the skills that you would rely on for the next 20 years? Creativity for me has always been the number one because it's not just artistic creativity, it's creativity in how to present yourself, on how to get indoors to be able to meet with people yeah. who you might not have access to. Uh, for me, it was creativity and figuring out how I was going to manufacture my product. I had no background in business or manufacturing. And so, you know, at the time, I don't know if I would have said it was creativity, but that has been the number one thing that has guided me through is taking my, you know, ability to take nothing and turn it into something. So a lot of the manufacturers I met with in early days were like, we don't make stuff like this. And I was like, but you could. What if we changed this and did this? And I realized early on, people say no quickly because uh, I don't know how to do it. I don't know if I can do it. But if they see you being persistent, then it inspires them too. So there's manufacturers I still work with who were like, we don't do this. And I was like, but it's kind of similar to this. Could we try this? And then they wouldn't return my call. But then when I called a third time, they'd mm -hmm. be like, okay, she's serious. So maybe we'll give her a chance. And they switched some of their production and some of the things that they were doing oh. to be able to make things the way I wanted to. And then that was an evolution for them as well. I see how this could fit with this. So there's innovation in there. Mm -hmm. There's communicating with clear vision and mm -hmm. persuasion. That's a piece of that formula. Mm -hmm. uh, and then persistence too. Well, that's the number one thing with yeah. entrepreneurship. It's yeah. the persistence. Because if you don't wake up in the morning and push yourself, even though it might have been a hard day the day before, there's no one else who's going to pick up the pieces for you. I think today in this kind of world of like, oh, it's not meant to be or mm. something, it's not giving up too soon. Yes. Right? Because you got to stick with something, even though it might not be moving or evolving as quickly as mm -hmm. you think in the moment. What were the skills that you really had to grow and adopt, like, personally and professionally? Mm -hmm. And then how did you see that reflected back in your business once you did evolve and grow? Leadership didn't come naturally to me. Leadership did, but leading a team didn't come okay. naturally to me. I think my first instinct as we started to grow was not to put too much pressure on people or, hmm. you know, I'll do it myself. And it took me a while to grow into a leader who could empower my people to feel confident to do it themselves. And I, you know, it takes time and it takes learning, but I'm lucky enough now I have this amazing team of people who are each empowered to do their own role and do a really good job of it. And we're able to learn from each other because I think growth as an entrepreneur, like as you 
you know, as your business grows and the people you're working with, if you uh, try and take it all on yourself and try and do it yourself, it, it won't succeed because you need to have people you can learn from, you can grow with, and uh, otherwise it becomes a bit stifling. And was the shift into that dynamic more like, I don't want to burden people or I don't want to put pressure on them? Like, I think it's a little bit of my personality, yeah. which is I don't want to put too much on you. So I'll take more on myself. Yeah. And as a, as a wife, as a mother, like yeah. that is just a personality thing. Um, and I have this amazing director of operations and she's the one who has always said, you know, we've got this great team, let people do what they're here to do. And I've had to learn that I don't have to execute on my vision alone. I'm very much an ideas person and we'll be sitting in meetings and I'm throwing out ideas on the spot and everyone's like, slow down mm. <laughs> one, one idea at a time. And so what my great team has really helped me do is it's like, let's take all the crazy ideas and let's work together to break it down into what is a crazy idea and what is an idea that has, you know, potential and legs that we should look into more. And we laugh a lot because, you know, a lot of the ideas that sometimes start off for me as, oh, this is has such potential will be like a weekend. And it's like, this is the worst idea I've ever come up with. So I think it's, you know, surrounding yourself with people who uh, can put you in your place and tell you you're wrong when you're wrong and you trust them enough to, to know that you are. And what are the mechanics of that process of, you know, really scoping ideas and flushing the good ones out from the bad ones? I try and go into our calls organized with these are my ideas, these are the important ones, and here's what we're going to execute on, and here are the crazy ones. Does anyone see any potential in these? Um, because I think as we sort of went through the pandemic and we learned how to do constant Zoom meetings and constantly be in touch, um, we had to learn as a team how to present ideas and how to manage our time and other people's time so we weren't mm. feeling overwhelmed. As you've thought about innovation in your business, like how do you balance risk taking innovation with product quality? I go back and forth between, you know, wanting to sort of be safe and we know what works and evolve slowly from there, but also wanting to take giant risks. Um, I personally break it down into, you know, big things that we can accomplish this year. Uh, medium things we can accomplish this year and small things we can accomplish this year. You know, you can't have a list of 30 huge projects in a year for us at least. Yeah. We don't have the resources and we want to make sure that we can put the time and energy into really seeing things succeed. And then, you know, it's constant list making where it's here are our priorities and that might be a daily or weekly shift because yeah. things that are up here on week one might have to move down in week two as other things take priority. But the one or two big goals that we set out for, which is usually in January of each year, yeah. we really stick to those and we prioritize them. Culturally, as you've grown with your business, mm -hmm. how have you kept the early day startup feeling <laughs> and cultural notes intact as you've grown through the years? It's tough because the person I was at, you know, 20 years old when yeah. I was coming up with these ideas you know, is very different than the mom of three kids in her 40s that I am now. Mm -hmm. You know, as your business grows, your role changes. Yep. And I've talked a lot about creativity. And that is really, you know, what gets me excited and the way my brain works. But that, you know, maybe is 10% of my role these days, mm -hmm. because as a CEO, and um, as a business leader, there is so much else that needs to get done. But I try and make time to come back to that creativity because that is what drives me and what excites me. Mm -hmm. Being a young entrepreneur, there's a lot of stress because your business is new. Mm -hmm. It's starting. You don't know where you're going. And as you grow or where I'm at now, there is stability yeah. and maybe a longing for like that excitement, the, the way it used to be when there was less pressure, maybe. Yeah. And I'm curious to get your perspective, you know, founder to CEO, mm -hmm. what changes like in your mind and in how you operate? I still go by founder. Mm -hmm. I, for me, always find, you know, I, I do use CEO to illustrate certain points, but I feel more like a founder yeah. and, a, and a creative director because yeah. I feel like I'm an architect of 
what we're doing and our growth and where we're going and the opportunities. So, and because I'm so hands-on to me, CEO feels more like behind a desk orchestrating the numbers and the, the direction. And so my creativity, my hands on nature, it makes me feel more like a, a founder and a creator. As you guys have thought about growth, I know diversifying your growth strategies has been important over the years, whether it's wholesale, retail, direct to consumer, and all of the experiments that you've uh, been through along the way. Mm -hmm. What has worked well for you guys? When we started, I was a university student and yeah. made headbands. I sold them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I had never been to a trade show. I had never done anything in the retail space. So having started without a clear vision, I opened myself up to try everything. Mm -hmm. Where I started was really in wholesale because I thought, okay, I'm going to go to trade shows. I'm going to open myself up to meeting a lot of different stores in one place. And that was a really strong way of doing business. And we, I think the second trade show I went to was in New York at the Javits Center. It was a gift show because we were making more accessories. So mm -hmm. I felt like I wanted to go to the gift shows as opposed to the fashion shows. And I think we wrote like $200,000 worth of headbands. Wow. And I'm thinking, oh my God, yeah. you know, maybe my business should be that I can sell to every small store in North America. And it doesn't matter if I'm not getting, you know, $40,000 orders from each store. But if I'm getting $2,000, $5,000 orders from each store, but I'm in 2,000 stores, like that might be a manageable and interesting way to grow. So we'd align ourselves with a showroom, we'd have a permanent little spot where they display our things, and then they'd have, you know, anywhere from 10 to 50 reps on the road for each region. So we were in a showroom in Denver, a showroom in New York, a showroom in Washington, a showroom in Atlanta. And what we would do is make sure that we had catalogs, line sheets, samples, and be available to the reps for them to fax in their orders. Mm -hmm. And we were in a lot of stores and doing really well and went from headbands to hats to scarves and we were slowly growing. And then the economy took a huge hit in the U.S. in 2008. Yeah. So that was an interesting lesson. I saw a lot of businesses that I had been side by side with go out of business. Yeah. And I think what saved us is that we had a few years earlier started doing direct to consumer at these retail shows, like the one of a kind show in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So that diversification, when wholesale took a massive hit, the showrooms closed, a lot of the stores that carried our stuff closed, we still had another outlet. And mm -hmm. it was a lesson to be learned that we were, you know, didn't have all our eggs in one basket. Yeah. And that has really carried me through. So when the pandemic hit, obviously none of us saw that coming, mm -hmm. but had I just been in wholesale, had I just been in retail, like I, I really would have floundered. And I saw once again, what we went through in 2008, where a lot of companies went under where I felt so lucky is we had a website, we were selling e-commerce direct to consumer. We had ads in market, you know, you had done ad testing and all of a bit of a funnel built. We had lots of funnels built and mm -hmm. really the conversation, you know, at the end of, of 2019 was, are we going to divert funds from the direct to consumer shows and put it into e-commerce growth? And the, the answer was yes, but it was a five-year plan. And then the pandemic hit and we did it in five months. And what was it like taking your organization through that journey? Like, did you have the talent in-house? Like, did the people have to come through a learning curve? It was definitely a daily pivot and it was, it's, it's a bit of a blur, yeah. you know, and people ask me all the time, how did you do it? And I say, there was no other choice. You know, if this goes on for one week, mm -hmm. um, where will we be at? This goes on for two weeks. If this goes on for four weeks, you know, I had all these scenarios and ultimately I sort of stopped at, I need to make sure my people are okay. Mm -hmm. And what can we do to make sure that we're not putting the company under, but we're also supporting our people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had, a, I had a smaller team at that time. 
And I sort of came to a really quick plan, which was we have the inventory. It's good inventory. If it takes us longer to sell it, if we don't sell one piece, how long, how long can we hold on for? Yeah. And I came up with a plan. I felt okay with it. Turned my attention to my kids, got everyone under control and then said, okay, since we have all this inventory, let's do a bigger sample sale than we normally do. Mm -hmm. We do a sample sale twice a year. And I said, you know, everyone's at home. You know, our sales had gone to zero. Every wholesale order we had had been canceled overnight. Every retail order mm -hmm. canceled overnight as, you know, everyone had the exact same thing. The world stopped. Two weeks later, I, th I thought, okay, you know, now what can we do? Let's just have a bigger sample sale online than we normally do. Up until that point, we'd done an in-person and then a small online. But because all of our retail shows had been canceled, we were actually sitting on even more inventory than we normally would. So, you know, everyone was busy with their kids. And this goes back to me as a founder, a CEO, saying, you know, this is what we need to do. But your kids and your family are your priority. So I remember the night before our programmer was like, I can't get this done, like in time to launch tomorrow. And I'm like, I don't want to push the launch. Like, let's just split it up. And I stayed up the entire night, mm -hmm. um, making sure the pictures were right, making sure everything was done. I did not sleep. And then at 9am we launched and we sold out in 45 minutes. And it was this moment where I said, everyone is at home. Everyone is feeling insecure and uncomfortable and we can provide that comfort and we have a way of doing this. And I took all of the money out of every retail show, out of every wholesale show we had committed to because everyone was offering, do you want your money back? Do you want us to keep it? And, you know, at that point, we didn't know if we'd be back in three yeah. weeks. And I originally thought, you know, you keep the money. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in three weeks and we'll just go back to our usual and I said, I'm making a decision. We're pulling all of our deposits and we're putting it all into e-commerce, all into ads, which we already had going. We just weren't funding them in a yeah, huge way. Double down on it. Oh, we quadrupled yeah. down on everything. I know that so many of us can relate to that moment, exactly that time where we thought this is going to bounce back six weeks max. How did you have the foresight that even if it does, mm -hmm. this is the better strategy? I'm not a pessimistic person at yeah. all, but I, I think I'm pragmatic. Yeah. And I just felt, I don't know what's going to happen, but there is no way we are bouncing back from this to be, everything's great and let's be at a trade show in three weeks. And, you know, had we not had that five-year plan in place, had we not been talking about this for two years yeah. already, I don't know if I would have acted so quickly. And so what went from long-term planning and strategic planning and projections went to daily decisions mm -hmm. because that's what the pandemic was. It was pivot, pivot, pivot. How do you feel about kind of the disruption of the team moves and how channels are changing as it relates to e-commerce? Mm -hmm. And does that affect at all your pressure to keep yourself as like a 100% manufactured in Canada, like your brand ethos mm -hmm. at all as you think about these disruptions. My pragmatic nature is to say, you know, the world evolves and changes. Manufacturing evolves and changes. Manufacturing overseas and in different countries isn't the same as it was 20 years ago. Um, and there's lots of great things out there. So we don't limit ourselves to Canada purely for one reason. Mm -hmm. Why we love being manufactured in Canada is because we love employing people in our community. Yeah. We love working with local companies. We love reducing our carbon footprint. That's like an added bonus. Mm -hmm. We love the hands-on nature and being able to be part of every step of the process. But we can't be as fast as the Timus. We can't be as fast as the Amazons. Yeah. Everything serves a purpose. I think fast fashion is just a whole other problem um that doesn't have an easy fix but i also don't think it's realistic to say well i'm never going to buy from a fast fashion brand ever again i think for us we're really all about balance mm -hmm. we're all about being realistic mm -hmm. and i think that the place that amazon has it will continue to grow, but it's going to change. You already see, whereas, you know, free shipping, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. has become such the norm in e-commerce, like over the past, let's say even five to 10 years. 
But now you're slowly seeing brands like Zara, they even charge three ninety five for shipping. Yeah. Or if you want to expedite your shipping, it's ten or twelve dollars. That small shift, I think, is a big indication of fuel is expensive, shipping is expensive. These brands can no longer take on the cost of free shipping. Yeah. However, they have created a culture where the free shipping is expected. So as those brands shift to be more in line with, you know, what small brands haven't been able to afford, yeah. I think it's bringing a little bit more of a balance back. Yeah, I, I do worry about the teams of the world, even just gamification, especially as a mother of young kids. Yeah. And the, I call it the add to cart culture. Yeah. It's almost like the way that we would make vision boards or, you mm -hmm. know, as young kids cut out magazines and make collages of toys we wanted or stuff we wanted. I almost see my kids adding stuff to cart as their way of like collecting their thoughts of what they want. And my husband and I talk about it all the time. We're like, it's a really weird thing. And, you know, we have these ongoing conversations about, you know, Buying from Amazon is a choice. Uh, buying from a local store or a local company or a made in Canada company, it's a choice. And you don't necessarily have to have one or the other, but it's important to be aware of the choice. Yeah. How do you see the modern entrepreneur different today as they navigate technology, distractions? Like mm -hmm. if you were starting as an entrepreneur yeah. today, mm -hmm. how would it be different given the environment? I think there's a lot more distractions. Yeah. But there is also so much more information at your fingertips. Yeah. So the advice that I give is, you know, it's progress over perfection. You, if you want to perfect an idea before going to market, you'll be working on it forever. So, you know, you have the ability with, with all the modern technology to put something out there and test it. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to do that. You know, obviously don't invest in a million pieces and then try it without being sure but if you can, you know, run tests and interact with your customers um, and get feedback to be able to grow from there, you don't have to wait until it's perfect to, to start. That is, you know, I think really important wisdom and insights and congratulations for really being able to have incredible instincts and foresights through an explosive growth opportunity, mm -hmm. I would say, and a very difficult decision with, with the pandemic. And supporting the team, supporting Canadian made goods. And thank you so much for being on this podcast. Well, thank you for having me. It was great. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn, where we transform the wisdom from our podcast into practical tips, tools, and takeaways for your leadership journey. Find us at grit.grace.podcast. See you next week.